Thank you very much, Evelyn. And thank you all, ladies, gentlemen, friends, Toastmasters, guests. It's an absolute honor to be with you today and to spend a bit of time talking about something that I feel was instrumental to this huge success I was fortunate to have a, a, a few months ago, mental toughness. You know, it's interesting. We all reach moments in our lives when we're faced with a tough situation and it's just screaming for us to give in. You know, everybody else has walked away. And, and what do you do? Do you walk away? Do you stay and fight? How do you make the choice to walk away or to stay and fight? Uh, as leaders, maybe we have a goal. We've communicated this goal to the team and suddenly circumstances have changed. You still want the goal, but your team, it starts to lose faith. Your managers start to lose faith, perhaps. And you start hearing this very popular phrase, get real. Have you ever been told to get real? Perhaps have you ever told yourself to get real? And maybe you don't have a team, but you still have a dream. And you're in this environment that constantly tells you, look, you really don't have much of a chance at this dream. Maybe you should aim lower, you know, something more realistic. I've heard that many times. If you're in an environment like that, do you stay and fight? Do you walk away? These situations call on a very important quality. They call on mental toughness. Mental toughness is loosely determined as the determination to go on even against the odds of success. So I'm pretty sure off the top, you can imagine a few situations where you perhaps have demonstrated mental toughness, or perhaps when somebody else has shown a resounding amount of mental toughness. Mental toughness is what brought us the light bulb. For example, mental toughness would be Winston Churchill saying, we will fight them on the beaches, for example. But like I said, mental toughness could be much more practical. It could be you wherever you are working on little sleep, holding down a job so you can make it through college. Uh, mental toughness could be you trying to start a new business. Mental toughness could be you trying to support your family. Mental toughness could be you trying to learn something new. And it has placed you in this educational where you're taking as many notes as you can and finding many ways to improve yourself. Mental toughness are all these situations where we are perhaps faced with the possibility to walk away. And perhaps we're even promised no judgment. It's okay. And mental toughness is that determination within us that tells us to try one more time or to stay the course and to not give up. So I'm sure you can already see some practical value in demonstrating mental toughness. And I hope you're already thinking of areas in your life where mental toughness could just be the difference. Today, I'm going to share with you what I consider one of my favorite, shall I say, tests of mental toughness. We're going to talk about the mindset that helped me through this test of mental toughness. And we're going to discuss something that I feel we can't skip when we're talking about mental toughness. And that is the difference between mental toughness and stubbornness. How do you know you'll be mentally tough and how do you know if you're just being stubborn and refusing to see reason? Well, if you're ready, friends, let's dive into this journey of mental toughness. Now, my test of mental toughness, my first international contest, this was back in Zimbabwe. It wasn't even a speaking contest. I made it on a basketball team, but it was exciting to tell people that I was going to compete internationally. Teams from all over the world. In fact, we were going to be wearing national colors. And I remember that first international contest because of how difficult it was for me to get there. I remember mom had to make quite a few sacrifices to get us the plane ticket. And so that I could be there with the rest of the team. It was very different to be there with a team where all of them could do shopping between games. And I was just there waiting for the next game. But I remember that international contest each time I entered uh, 
I remembered it each time I entered these speaking contests in Toastmasters International. And so you can imagine me on June the 30th, having received that email, congratulations, Cyril, we're inviting you to participate in the semifinals. This year, it's going to be held hybridly, partly in Nashville and, and partly online. And it's interesting because I'm looking at this contest and thinking, well, I can actually afford to be there this time. Well, not only that, part of this trip is sponsored. So I don't really have to worry about getting there, except, except for the fact that I don't live in Zimbabwe anymore. Now, I'll explain why this is important in a moment. But ever since I entered these speech contests, I had a goal. I had a goal to do well, as well as I could, as well as could humanly be possible. And whenever my friends said, maybe Cyril, you never know, one day you could be the world champion. I always had this one picture in mind of me walking out onto this infinite, seemingly infinite stage, the lights on my face, the audience going wild, the contest chair perhaps butchering my name or something. But every time I thought of the world championship, it was always going to happen in person. It was always going to happen physically. And it became the dream, but I'm very specific. I wanted the dream to happen exactly how I dreamed it. And I felt that anything else would be settling. So you can imagine how I felt during the pandemic competing. And so now we come back to June the 30th, where now I've been presented with an opportunity to live out this dream, or at least a part of it. Now, I live in Poland. And in order for my stay here to be legal, I need to have a residence permit. Now, I don't have one at the moment. My case is still being processed by the immigration office. They said they would get back to me the same way a friend says, uh, I'll call you and, and tell you my answer later on. In the same vein, I hold a Zimbabwean passport, which probably means, which definitely means I'm going to need the American visa. Top that all with the fact that I've got about two months to be contest ready and to field a speech that could actually do something against some of the best speakers in the world. And I started hearing that voice in my head. Well, Cyril, why don't you get real? It's more than likely that you're going to compete online. You're not gonna be there physically. I mean, fine, maybe you can still pull it off somehow, but it's not going to be that dream that you've had. It's not going to be the goal that you've had of walking out onto a stage, having lights in your face, having the crowd going wild. Perhaps at the very least, Cyril, get real. And I'll never forget a couple of weeks down the line because I communicated my situation to the semifinals team. I'll never forget the day I received an email saying, look, we know you're having a bit of trouble getting to Nashville physically. Here's the link for the online briefing. See, I, I couldn't bring myself to respond to that email. It, it triggered me so much because there I was. The goal was clear. I knew what I'd wanted. I'd worked towards it. But here were the circumstances telling me to get real. Now, to shed a bit of light on that, on that I live in Lower Silesia in Poland. And I personally know people who waited nearly two years to get their residence permit. Add on to that the fact that there's a war next door. So a few hundred thousand people have now made it across the border. They're now joining the same line, waiting for the same permits, but they have priority because of their refugee status. And again, that voice in my head is saying, I know the goal, but get real. It's no way, there's, there's not enough time, there's no way that this is going to happen. I've reached out to the American embassy and I've told them the situation and I have gotten an interview for the visa, but it's on the 21st of December, 2023. Twice I've applied for an emergency interview for the visa and it's been rejected with no reason given and they don't have to tell me the reason. Now I'm thinking I... I hate working with bureaucrats in general, but two sets of bureaucrats, while I'm preparing for a contest, I still have a life of my own on the side. Actually, I have a job that I have to keep. 
but I still know the goal and everything is pointing me towards this, my need to get real, to keep it real. And the day I received that email, the email of, look, you're probably not going to make it. Here's the online briefing for online contestants. Just, you know, it became a bit of a turning point in the process, albeit an accidental one. Because I didn't respond to that email, I couldn't. But I did start complaining quite a bit. I complained to my girlfriend, I complained to my club president, I complained to my mentor, I complained to everybody that could listen. Look at what is happening to me. It's, it's not fair. I've worked for this for so long. It doesn't make sense. What's the point of me even competing if I can't do it the way I've always dreamed to do it? And I started competing to, I started complaining. I complained in weakness, but it revealed that I had a bit of a strength and that I wasn't alone. My girlfriend almost instantaneously changed her language entirely. She started saying, when we are in Nashville, and every time we spoke of preparing for the contest, she used that definitive language of when we are in Nashville. Now, uh, day one, I see my girlfriend changing that language overnight. And on that same day, my girlfriend's sister's friend tells me that she's going to reach out to somebody she knows who works in the immigration office. Day two, my club president is writing a letter to the American embassy, to the immigration office in my behalf. Day three, my district director has now been brought into the mix. She's writing in my behalf, pleading in my behalf. Day four, the regional director is writing in my behalf. And I'm looking at these people laying brick after brick to build hope. And all of a sudden, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what I want or the dream. It's suddenly become bigger. And I'm suddenly looking at these people who clearly have more faith in how this is going to end than I do. And I'm asking myself, what if I wanted to walk away too soon? What if this was another test of mental toughness? You see, my goal, your goal, all our goals in that, in that fact, they are not a mere function of execution. They are a function of the mindset we carry into execution. See, I'm sure you agree with me that it's one thing to just get the job done or to just chip away towards the goal. I'm sure you'll also agree to me that it's another thing to walk into executing that goal with the right mindset, with the kind of mindset that helps you to stay the course. And at this moment, when I saw so many people invested towards bringing this goal to fruition, I started thinking, well, perhaps I need to take steps to stay the course as well. Now, I'll admit what I did next was a bit uncalled for, a bit of a wild card. But in retrospect, I would say it was a necessary step towards freeing me emotionally to work towards the goal. So at the end of June, I let go at the end of well, mid-July, actually, I let go of my job and I begin practicing three things, my keys to building mental toughness. And the three things that I'd like to share with you today. Now, keep in mind, these are my keys and each person will find their remedy for working against adversity or swimming against the tide. The goal of these is just to remind you, the listener, that if you approach adversity deliberately, if you approach resistance deliberately, then it is more than likely that you're going to stay the course. So friends, I'm going to share my screen briefly. I'm going to show you a few of the, oh, I believe I do not have screen sharing enabled if
if the host could allow me to share. Yes, Sadia, you can share. Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. So I've set out a goal for myself that I'd like to speak in the contest on a physical stage, that I'd like to do it with the lights, with the crowd, with the contest chair, the whole nine yards. I'm faced with these hurdles. I have only two months to make sure that I have a residence permit that will allow me to get on the plane, to get a visa that will allow me entry into the United States and to get speeches or to prepare my speeches so that the whole trip is worth it anyway. And I now have this support system that is helping me towards this goal. But I try, I start practicing something more deliberately in that process, which becomes well, my keys to mental toughness. And the first one being to treat your work as sacred. Now, I know it's a, it's it's it sounds strong to say treat your work as sacred, and there there is a tendency to think, well, it's it's rather not that, yeah, it's it's just a simple goal that I'm ebbing towards. Now, initially, when I was thinking of this goal, I always thought about it in terms of what it would get me. This goal was centered around myself. I want to do it, and I want it to be this way because that's how I envisioned it. What I mean when I say treating your work as sacred is thinking of it in terms of its value and what that work will give to others rather than what it will give to yourself. And with that knowledge, giving due diligence to the rehearsal and preparation leading up. So what I did in my case was I let go of, oops, there we go of anything that distracted from the goal, which in this case would have been a job that tied me down eight to 10 hours of the day at a time when I would rather be working towards making sure I got this residence permit and this visa. Of course, in that time, I had to make sure I wasn't letting go of any obligations I had towards myself regarding rehearsal. In those two months, I would say I probably performed more rehearsals off the five or so speeches we had at the time than I had the entire year before. And it made a big difference in the end because mental toughness as well comes off the fact that you know you're doing the right thing. You know you're doing everything possible to ensure a positive outcome. So treating my work as something important, something of value, something that would give value to others, something that could not be distracted, or something that I could not allow anything to detract from, it became a game changer when I was faced with the opportunity to walk away. Now, of course, I still had to deal with the elephant in the room, which was the fact that I still didn't have the residence permit or the visa, and that I was facing a great amount of resistance leading up into the contest. Now, as we're going to discuss later on, of course, and as world champion 2021 Verity Price said, you write your own story, which is to say you set the narrative for what it is that's going on and that's happening to you. Take a look at what became a second pillar of mental toughness. And that was keeping the options open. It's often discouraging when the only plan we have fails. And actually, it's at that moment when the only plan we have fails that many people find it forgivable, easier to walk away. Now, I'm sure you know as well as I do that there are many ways to get the job done. And there are many people who can help you to get the job done. The turning point for me was in realizing that I had a network around me, a network of friends, friends that had become family, Toastmasters and so forth, who are willing to help me towards this goal. Now, having your options open, it, like I said, makes it much easier when you meet a hurdle or when one of your plans fails. And I can readily think of a few times when a plan failed. So the immigration office, this immigration office that's notorious for late responses, 
happens to have a helpline that you can call. And I call this helpline and it's always the same old grumpy voice that picks up. And I, I explain my situation to this guy. And I say, look, I've been invited to this contest. It's my life's work. I've been working on it for so long. I just need to get this card so I can fly out. Can you please help me? And he says the same thing each time. Like, look, there's nothing we can do for you. Uh, you wait like everybody else. I'm seeing your file. You should get your residence permit in about September. Now, this is something they tell everybody. They give it about three months and then he hangs up on me. I call again on a different day, 30 minute wait, same guy picks up and I can almost sing along as he's telling me no. But then because I've got these people who can possibly speak to him in his language, in his native, in Polish, because I have people who can write to other people working, it seems I always have options open and he's not that gate that will see me out of getting on the plane. And then last but not least, regarding keeping your options open, I had to convince myself that even though I had two months and even though the odds seemed insurmountable, there was something conspiring to help me succeed. Now, I'll be honest, this was the most difficult, difficult, difficult belief to build because, again, you're looking at the circumstances which are clearly pointing you towards a firm no. And through all of that, you're trying to tell yourself that there is still something that is saying, I deserve to succeed. I deserve for this to go well. This leads me well into this third bit, the third pillar of mental toughness, which I feel really supported me. And it was the idea that there was a higher power somewhere that was conspiring to help me succeed. That if I had done everything to remove distractions, if I had done my bit to do everything I could in the time and at the time, that things were going to be all right. Now, you've probably noticed the bottle behind me. There's a story behind that. So, well, naturally, you know how this story ends. I got on the plane. But after this long fight with two separate offices, I felt drained emotionally. I felt I needed any crutch I could to survive this. I'm not saying I became an alcoholic. No, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But before I left this room to go to the airport, I found that bottle in my wardrobe. Now that bottle was a gift from a friend. And he said, look, open this when you have a reason to celebrate one day. Now I'm looking at the bottle and for the first time I take time to read it. And I notice it says Tennessee whiskey. Now, when I say convince yourself that a higher power is conspiring to help you succeed, I remembered my friend saying, open that when you have a reason to celebrate. And I look at the bottle and say, it's, and it says Tennessee whiskey. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to Tennessee. This is a sign. And I put that bottle there and I said, I'm going to open it as soon as I'm back, which I haven't been able to do. <laughs> but that became a turning point in my way of thinking about everything that had happened. Now, if you remember earlier on, I had been complaining about all this. This has been, a, it had been a sore spot. Why is this happening to me? And from the moment that thinking changed and I started to set the narrative for what I was going through, giving up became less and less of an option. You see, you are able to look at whatever is pulling you back and you can acknowledge it as something that is pulling you back. You can complain about it and you're well within your rights. Or you can give it a different label. In fact, in my case, call it, I stopped calling it adversity. I stopped calling it an unfair obstacle. And I started saying anything that is happening, which is unfavorable from this moment on, I'm going to call it a sign. If it's pulling me back, it's a sign that something great is about to happen because nothing good comes easy. And this is me talking to myself, having that internal dialogue that is going to convince me first 
that something out there is conspiring to help me to succeed. But more than that, you also set the emotional tone as you walk the path towards your goal. It's one thing to put a label on whatever you're going through as you try to get to your goal. It's another thing as well to choose what your disposition will be going on into this. Now, I remembered and I knew quite well that I was going up possibly against some of the best speakers in the world. Speakers who've been preparing for years. Interestingly, speakers who've also been dreaming, dreaming about this in their own way. Perhaps they've dreamt it slightly differently, but they have their own dream. And I had to convince myself before I left that anything less than the real Cyril, anything less than Cyril at his emotional 100% wouldn't cut it. So I had to let go of anything that would remove from that. And I had to stay in touch with anybody who reminded me of that. And in this case, I was very fortunate to have my girlfriend at my side. It's interesting how she would always speak in terms of when we are in Nashville, when we are in Nashville. That positive, that positive way of thinking it definitely changed the way I was looking at things. But then something I started adding on and perhaps something you can start adding on as you think about how to build mental toughness. It is speaking the language of, I'll start from there. One thing I've tried not to do in this keynote is promise you that if you do this, you're going to succeed. Because friends, I'm sure you agree with me as well. There are no promises. And I'm pretty sure I'm surrounded right now by people who know what it is to try and try and try and try and still not get it and still feel like they've failed when it is all said and done. I cannot promise you success, but unfortunately, nobody can. But one thing I told myself is, if I am doing my best, the best I can in this moment, at this moment, in this time, and if I still fail, I will start from there. If they don't, if today they say, no, we're not giving you the residence permit, I will start from there. If the American embassy is not going to give me an interview for the visa, if their answer is no, I will start from there and I will start fighting from there. If one of these two says yes and the other says no, I will start from there. If both of them say yes, but I don't have time to make a groundbreaking speech, I will start from there. Thinking of things in these terms, it reminds you that the journey might be a long one. But subconsciously, it tells you one thing. Whichever twist and turns I find on my path, I'm not going to stop. And I find that this is much more potent than saying, never give up, keep on keeping on. Because in my case, this language, the language of I'll start from there, it ticked all the boxes. Well, I'll get real. If you've been told to get real, I was being real. And I was acknowledging that on the way to the goal, there might be failures. But if those failures come along, I'll start from there. So what are my pillars so far, if you've been following along? The first pillar was that, well, we can, we can go back up to it, to treat the work as sacred, to remind myself of the value of the work I was doing. That made it easier to stay the course to remove distractions and to treat resistance as a sign of good things to come. Of course, I try to fight from many fronts. It is much easier to walk away when your only egg or all the eggs in one basket have been crushed. It is more difficult to walk away when you've got a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, if you must. And especially if you've got many people who also present opportunities 
helping you out. So mental toughness is about building that team around you. And last but not least, mental toughness is a function, was a function in my case, of convincing myself that I had the, shall I say, boldly, of course, the moral right to at least see my dream through, to at least be on a stage, regardless of the result, to at least have that experience of standing on a stage and saying, hey, I, I dreamed about this a while ago. In fact, a while further back, this would have probably been a very expensive trip for my family. Convincing yourself that you deserve what you're working towards is key in building mental toughness. You set then you, you define the narrative of the path you're walking on. You also set the emotional tone. And if you speak the language of, I may fail, I may stumble, but whatever happens on the road to the goal, I will start from there. It becomes much easier to stay the course and to not walk away when the odds are against you. Now, friends, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, There we go. I can't seem to, okay, I think I believe I stopped sharing. <laughs> All right. So now we are, we answer that last question that I was, that I promised we talk about. And that is discerning between mental toughness and stubbornness. Now, earlier we defined mental toughness as the determination to stay the course even against the odds of success. Mental toughness is your answer to the phrase, get real, or people saying, be more realistic. Mental toughness is what helps you stay the course even when everybody else walks away. But how do you differentiate that from stubbornness? You see, I had moments as well when I thought, aren't you being a bit vain to assume that things must work out and that you should be there? What is it about you that makes your goal so important that everything around you should morph into form so that your goal comes to fruition? How do you differentiate staying the course towards something worthwhile from just being stubborn and not knowing when to quit? Well, I'm going to introduce one word, word that you know well, but that I haven't used entirely in this keynote and intentionally so. And that's the idea of purpose. And I will try and redefine mental toughness in the capacity that it served me best. And that's what the idea that mental toughness is the determination to carry on against the odds of success. And it best serves us when we are trying to succeed in achieving our purpose. I'm pretty sure, friends, you know that feeling when we're doing things out of obligation, when you're doing things because you have to. And I'm pretty sure you've also felt the euphoria of doing something out of conviction. The difference between mental toughness and stubbornness, at least in this capacity, is that the mental toughness we're talking about will best serve you when you're working towards something you are convinced is your purpose, as opposed to doing something that you're only doing out of obligation or when you're compelled to do something. In that vein, I gave myself a simple rule that I try to live by each and every day. And perhaps you can make a similar rule for yourself or make any such principle to help you know when you're exhibiting, when you're demonstrating mental toughness, or when maybe you're being stubborn. So my rule is that, Cyril, never allow yourself to be robbed of peace, to be robbed of health, to be robbed of happiness, building another man's dream. But also, 
Never rob yourself of your dream by giving anything less than your very best. This is my, this is my rule. Never allow yourself, Cyril, to be robbed of peace, health, or happiness building another man's dream. But never rob yourself, Cyril, of this dream by giving anything less than your best. Mental toughness, I'm pretty sure we can now conclude, is born of principle, not necessarily rules. And this is why I state this rule as my rule. And I encourage you to think of a rule you can make for yourself, a principle you can make for yourself that qualifies the work you're doing as being a part of your purpose rather than being something you simply have to do. Because therein lies the difference between demonstrating mental toughness and simply being stubborn. So friends, this is the stuff that mental toughness was made of, in my case. The odds may not always favor you. The temptation to walk away may be very real. But if you treat your work as sacred, that is, think of anything you're doing in terms of its value, in terms of what it will give once the job is done and remove anything that detracts from this value. If you remember that there are many roads towards your destiny and many people on many roads who can help you in many ways towards your destiny. And if you can convince yourself that you deserve a positive outcome, that a higher power somewhere is conspiring to help you succeed based on the merit of your work alone, then you will brave the storm that is reaching your goal. And maybe you won't get it the first time. Maybe you won't get it the second time. Maybe you will fail and fail and fail again. But this, I believe, is where mental toughness shines. In fact, I am I'm moved to believe and I'm moved to say right now that quick success builds ego. With slow success, tests of your mental toughness, they build character. So take a moment to think about opportunities that you have to walk away. Maybe it's stubborn of you not to walk away. Maybe, and just maybe, mental toughness will help you to fully exploit these situations and work towards the best possible outcome. Mental toughness, staying the course even when the odds are against you, even when reason is saying stop, may just be the difference maker when it comes to reaching your goal, and especially when it comes to making your journey to the goal worthwhile. I learned it. I lived it. I observed it. And I hope from my story, you can glean a thing or two, or at least you're thinking about how you are going to work on cultivating and demonstrating mental toughness. Thank you.